Welcome back, my friends, to the next edition of Monday Night Live. As you can tell, this evening I'm missing my lovely partner, boss, manager, wife, Nisha. She is working on a project, which I'll tell you about in just a few minutes. If I don't tell you later in this video, remind me in the comments, and I will tell you what Nisha Solace Heifenberry is up to. Welcome, everyone. Don't forget to remind Uncle Elmer and Aunt Hattie. You know, they always forget to catch this live. So send them a text or a direct message right now so that we can help them improve their health as well. I'm going to be with you for the next hour, answering as many questions as I can. Joanna's already hit the thumbs up and shared this video. You're welcome to do the same. It helps me reach new people who have not yet heard the good news about a proper human diet and how I can radically alter their health for the better. Angelic Annihilator is going to lead us off tonight. She said, uh, Angelic Annihilator, I'm assuming she, uh, you told me a while back that bone broth and PRP can help repair joint cartilage damage. What about spinal discs? This is, this is effectively made of the same thing as joint cartilage. They are both a vascular. That's why it takes a very long time to heal. If you cut your skin, it's healed within a week or two. If you tear or cut a muscle, it's healed within a week or two. When it gets inside of the joint, there is no blood supply to the cartilage in an adult. And so the, the healing and repair things have to get there through diffusion through the synovial fluid. So it takes quite a while. Uh, it's not an overnight fix. It takes many months of eating a proper human diet and of uh, doing other things like PRP or, or prolotherapy. Jennifer says, hey, Dr. Barry, been on ketovore since September. A1C is 4.9, down from 7.7. .7. So in September, October, November, December, in three months, our friend Jennifer has completely reversed her type 2 diabetes. Oh, and also lost 35 pounds. There's also that. Thank you for all you do. Jennifer, it's my pleasure. Now that you know how to use a proper human diet to completely reverse type 2 diabetes, the way you pay this forward is to start teaching your friends and family with prediabetes or metabolic syndrome or type 2 diabetes. Just teach them how to eat real human food and you can help them glean the same benefits. Margaret, I'm not very close to Trenton. I'm not too far away, but I'm not that close either. Uh, Saira, does carnivore diet help with a child seven years old uh, who's on the spectrum? So there's actually a movie about a ketogenic diet and what it can do with a, for a child with autism called The Magic Pill. Uh, it used to be you could watch it on YouTube. I'm not sure where you have to watch that now, but if you do an internet search for the Magic Pill movie, you can find that, and you will uh, everything that keto does. A high fat fat carnivore diet is going to do exactly the same thing. We've gotten feedback from hundreds of parents and grandparents who have a child on the spectrum who have reported dramatic improvements in their symptoms, uh, dramatic reduction in their symptoms. So I would highly, highly recommend you watch The Magic Pill. Oh, look at Miles. Miles' hemoglobin A1C went from 12.9 down to 5.2 in three months. So went from a severe type 2 diabetic to having an exquisite A1C in three months. Isn't that funny? And yet the, the American Diabetes Association has not held a press conference announcing that you can reverse your type 2 diabetes, even though hundreds of thousands of people are in the process of doing that as we speak. Isn't that kind of cool? There's Paola. Uh, we've got Paola. We've got Kevin. We've got Mitzi. We've got maybe um, uh, Nurse Cindy and Two Crazy Ketos as our moderators and Marsha, uh, who are going to be answering beginner questions. So if you see somebody with a wrench beside their name, a blue wrench, yes, a blue wrench, they are a moderator for this channel and they uh, know what they're talking about. So if they answer your question, you can take it to the bank. Rust, Rustus Android. Last time you gave me element, element, element chocolate salt as a thing to drink besides water. 
how many can I have in a day? I'm drinking like five of them. LOL, probably too much, right? So keep in mind that for millions of years, the only thing our ancestors had to drink was breast milk until they were weaned and then water for the rest of their life. So water is all you need. Now, of course, we'd like to break the monotony every now and then. And so we add some Redmond's Relight uh, electrolyte powder or some Element electrolyte powders. Uh, and then uh, the, the chocolate salt is an excellent thing to put a little bit in your coffee. Gives a little bit of a hint of chocolate flavor. Add some salt to your coffee. It's very tasty. Uh, but you, you don't need five of them a day. You're wasting your money if you're drinking five a day. Don't do that. Robert, in your opinion, for those of us that have that just have to have some sweetness in our coffee and tea, which is better, monk fruit or allulose or stevia? Uh, my answer to this is yes, Robert. Whichever one seems to to not cause bloating or stomach issues for you, uh, then that's probably fine. But use all sweeteners in strict moderation. Uh, most of us put way too much sweetener in our coffee. You need just enough sweetener to soften the bitterness of the coffee. You don't need, if you've put in enough sweetener in your coffee that it tastes really sweet, that's too much sweetener. You're not enjoying the true taste of the coffee. Thank you very much, Tina. Uh, tonight, this is a Christmas edition. Oh, I'll tell you what Nisha's doing here in a second. Um, I, through the this live, I'm going to be telling you gift ideas uh, that you might get for someone who's special to you that uh, we have tried personally and that we we approve of. Highly sensitive. Dr. Ken, I'm a 38-year-old female, two months on carnivore diet, had bladder cancer and found and now found out I have renal AML. Have you heard of anyone healing these things on the carnivore diet? So a bladder cancer is a solid tumor. So the, the lower your blood sugar is, the better. The higher your blood sugar is, the more you're going to be feeding that cancer and allowing it to thrive and metastasize. So you want to keep your blood sugar very low, and there's nothing like a meat-heavy keto diet or a ketovore diet or a carnivore diet to do that. Uh, I do notice pain in the right kidney sometimes. Now, AML, AML is, is a different monkey. Uh, definitely, you want to reap all the benefits that eating a proper human diet is going to give you, and a carnivore diet is on the proper human diet spectrum. Uh, but you need to follow up closely with your doctor for both of these conditions. Fit and focus, keto four years and now carnivore last six months. Developed bursitis in my elbow this week. Doesn't really hurt yet. What should I do? Stay active. Keep moving the joint. Uh, don't do any strenuous exercise with the joint, but you want to keep using that joint and moving it. And then keep eating a very, very uninflammatory diet that's full of, that's very nutrient dense and full of all the things your body's going to use to calm down the inflammation and heal that bursa. Uh, if it's not better in a few weeks or if the pain's very, very severe, go see your doctor. Sometimes they can put a little tiny steroid injection right into the bursa. It doesn't circulate through your entire body. It just stays right there and that'll calm the inflammation down. But most people on a carnivore diet or a meat heavy keto diet or anywhere in between notice that things like this, that they still pop up because we're still mortal. We're still human. We're still going to have things happen, but they heal much, much quicker and they don't get nearly as severe as they would have otherwise. Good question. Craig, I see your backdrop of books and wonder what they are. Post your reading list. You know, I actually, tomorrow in our private group, I'm going to, I'm going to uh, just video very slowly each shelf of my books because you, I am an eclectic ADHD, um, I wouldn't say polymath, but autodidact, definitely. Uh, but I, I read very widely, very deeply, different subjects, uh, obviously deeply in nutrition and medicine, but uh, anthropology, archaeology, paleoanthropology, uh, paleopathology, paleonutrition, uh, also farming. I got tons of farming books that are over here, and most of my medical stuff's over here. And there's even more right behind me here that you can't see. But yeah, I'm going to do that in our private group tomorrow. If you want to uh, become a member, Craig, and, and see all the book spines close up so you can be like, oh, I haven't seen that book. I'm going to, I'm going to get that. I'll do that tomorrow in our private group. Yeah, so uh, Paola brought this up. So I'll go ahead and say if, if, if you want to get somebody you love, including yourself, a proper human diet t-shirt or long sleeve t-shirt or a hoodie 
Uh, I think they have tank tops and other things with the logo on it. There's a link down in the show notes where you can get that from. That'd be a great Chris, Christmas present. It may not make it there by Christmas. I mean, I trust the U.S. Postal Service, don't you? But um, it's the thought that counts, right? So uh, they also have the beef, butter, bacon, and egg shirt there as well. Thank you, Paolo, for reminding me about that. So Nisha is actually in the process right now of recording a new song, new video for her sing channel. Uh, Nisha has a an angelic voice. Every time she sings, it makes me cry. And for those of you who know me, you know just what that says, because it, it ain't easy to make me cry. Uh, but she's working on that. It's a Christmas song. I'm not going to tell you what it is. Uh, there's a link down to her channel, her singing channel. She has several channels, but that one's in the show notes. So that go ahead and subscribe to that and turn on notifications so that when she does drop that new Christmas song, you can enjoy it with your family. It's beautiful. I've already been listening to parts of it as she uh, diagnosed. Now look at Sharla. First started with an A1C of 8.5. Then now she got it down to 7.4 and now down to 6.9. She's already reversed type 2 diabetes. She just has just pre-diabetes now. Sharla, keep doing exactly what you're doing. Check that A1C every three months. Try to get your doctor to check a fasting insulin and or a C-peptide so that you know that your insulin's coming down as well. And you're going to be diabetes free in just a few more months, Charla. Huzzah. Well done. Now it's time to start teaching your friends and family how to do it. Jeff, is it possible to do carnivore without red meat? Yes, it is. Uh, suspect an intolerance because I feel weak, fatigued, and fluid retention after eating it. Tried all kinds. Maybe, Jeff, that would be highly, highly unusual, like one in a million unusual, but it's possible. You may have been bitten by a tick that has made you temporarily allergic to mammalian meat, the meat of mammals. So you can absolutely do a carnivore diet with seafood and with uh, poultry of different types. Uh, I don't think that kind of carnivore is as good as a carnivore diet full of ruminant meat like beef and sheep and goat, but I think it's a thousand times better than a standard American diet. So uh, if you want to get someone you love something for their kitchen, I highly recommend Redmond's smoked salt. This salt tastes like my great grandmother Henson's kitchen used to smell. She had an old cast iron wood stove and she very often would be uh, cooking over hickory. This smells exactly like her kitchen. Every time I put this salt, oh, literally it just, it, nostalgia just comes in of my great grandmother's kitchen. So there's a link to the Redmond site if you want to get that. Saira, hello, Dr. Barry, is unsweet black tea bad? No, I don't think so. I think any uh, unsweetened black coffee is fine. I think any unsweetened tea, whether it's black tea, brown tea, green tea, white tea, is there another color of tea? They're, they're all fine. Now, some people do have trouble with oxalates, uh, so you got to kind of tease that out, but the vast majority of people can drink a cup of, of or two of tea or coffee a day and not have any problem. Uh, also, sparkling water is fine as long as it's unsweetened. And then just water like we've been drinking for millions of years. God forbid you drink some water, right? All right, Felipe, Felipe. Hey, Dr. Barry, I'm clean carnivore for one month now, but have been with mild pain on my upper right abdomen. Everyone tells me to cut the animal fat because I'll have to remove my gallbladder. Should I continue? Uh, yeah, there's nothing, uh, nothing about a proper human diet that's gonna hurt your gallbladder, Felipe. Um, you may have had a, 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 a gallbladder dysfunction. You may have had gallbladder sludge. You may have had a gallstone or two, and you're, you're now on a proper human diet spectrum, and so you're, you're working on reversing those conditions, and that can sometimes lead to some mild right upper quadrant pain, right upper abdominal pain. Now, I would advise you to go see your doctor and get an ultrasound. Make sure there's nothing else going on because right upper abdominal pain can be caused by about a hundred different things. But the most likely reason is that you, you're correcting your gallbladder dysfunction, which is a weak, floppy 
muscular wall of your gallbladder, or you had gallbladder sludge, and every time you eat a fatty ribeye, your gallbladder is having to constrict and push that sludge out of the tiny duct, and that causes some temporary pain. I don't think this will continue for much longer. Sufficient me recently started a carnivore heavy lifestyle and I feel better. Just a slight headache, but thank you for the education, Dr. Barry. My pleasure. Sufficient me. Make sure that you eat your carnivore diet with pride and encourage your friends to ask you questions. Tia, are electrolytes absolutely necessary to have every day or just when we're extra active sweating a lot? So when you're transitioning from a high carb diet over to keto, ketovore or carnivore, I think that electrolytes are going to help with the carbohydrate withdrawal. They're going to minimize cramping. Uh, there's a, a diuresis that happens when you decrease your carbs, thus decrease your insulin. And the electrolytes are going to help you get you through that transition period until you're fully keto adapted. Uh, more and more carnivores uh, and people on keto who've been on, on it for years use electrolytes less and less and less. And some don't use them at all unless they're doing some kind of strenuous exercise where they're sweating like a horse, in which case they'll they'll use some electrolytes and, and add some extra salt. But you're onto something here. I don't I don't think I think a lot of the things we talk about <clears throat> on a keto or a carnivore diet, you're not going to need forever. For example, uh, keto chow's daily mineral drops. If the soil that your food grew in or the, the soil that your food grazed on doesn't have minerals in it, then your food's not going to have the minerals in it. And that's why I help keto chow design daily minerals. Isn't that pretty? Look at that new bottle. It's got a little glass medicine dropper. It's a glass bottle. Uh, but hopefully all of you guys are becoming more and more interested in regenerative agriculture and you're starting to improve the soil where you live. I hope you're doing that because when enough of us have done that for long enough, you won't need this anymore because the, the minerals will be available in your soil again. And so the food you grow in it or the food that grazes on the grass that grew in the soil will be full of minerals and you won't need this. But currently you might need this. There's a link down below. Good question. Uh, Rustus Android again. Started having PVCs about two months ago. They were pounding every five to 30 beats. You think carnivore might help? Perhaps. But the first thing you need to do, Rustus Android, is go see your doctor and get this thoroughly checked out. Very, very often PVCs are not a big deal. They're not a sign of pathology. But if you're having just repetitive runs that last for 30 beats, you got to go get checked out by a cardiologist, okay? You need some testing done to make sure there's nothing else going on. Uh, and and you, can be, you can be getting your heart testing done while you're slowly converting to a carnivore diet. Good question. We got a new member to the channel, John Watts. Welcome. Brittany Goodwin, what vitamin supplements food would you recommend to help with fatigue? So first of all, Brittany, you need to be eating a proper human diet. And if you don't know what that means, and some of you guys who are brand new may be like, well, that sounds appealing, but I don't know what the hell that means. There's a link down in the show notes that explains, uh, it's a video, all the principles of a proper human diet. <clears throat> so once you're eating nutrient-dense, low-carbohydrate, ancestrally appropriate foods, then you start saying, okay, do I need any vitamins, any minerals, any supplements? And so uh, most people at this time of the year at Northern Latitudes, Brittany, need some vitamin D. You can't get enough from the sun. I've got a video on YouTube about vitamin D rich foods. That'll help you. But if you don't like any of those, you might wind up taking 5,000 IUs of vitamin D3 once a day, at least during the winter. And then when the sun comes back out, you can just get daily sun and you won't need as much or any of the vitamin D. Another thing that many people are very deficient in, especially people with fatigue, if you also have cold feet and cold hands and you're like, if you're in a room with 10 people, you're always the one freezing, you might be deficient in iodine. I've got several videos on this channel about iodine. Uh, also, when, when uh, Keto Chow and I designed the Daily Minerals, it has 500 micrograms of iodine per serving to help get your iodine back up as you also eat some iodine rich foods. For the vast majority of people on a proper human diet, that's about all you need, Brittany, is, is iodine, vitamin D, and then the minerals that come along with the iodine in the daily mineral drops. Good question. Good to hear from you, Brittany. Angelic Annihilator again. Spirulina shown to promote detoxifying radiation from the body. Thoughts on using to combat our environment. Not ancestral, but may be necessary today. So if we do have a radioactive event, 
than uh, taking mega doses of iodine and maybe even some mega doses of spirulina might be necessary. But currently, our the, the vast majority of our environments where we live is not radioactive enough that you need to waste your money on spirulina. Uh, keep in mind, also, anytime you see research like that done about a specific thing, always go to the very bottom of the research study and look for conflicts of interest, look for funding. Uh, my guess would be that this study was funded by a company that makes a spirulina supplement. And therefore, they have a vested interest in the study showing a benefit. Tina, my husband changed his diet from SAD, which stands for Standard American Diet, which is a shit diet full of high carbohydrate, highly processed food, lots of sugar, lots of fructose, lots of grains, lots of vegetable seed oils. He still drinks chocolate milk and eats ice cream, takes meds for high blood pressure and metformin for type 2 diabetes. Do I still use cholesterol numbers as if he was... CV, uh, his total cholesterol, 257, triglycerides, 298, HDL, 33. So his triglycerides are still very high. And the reason they're still too high is because he's still ingesting, maybe not eating, but he's still ingesting too many carbohydrates for him, too much sugar. That's the chocolate milk and the ice cream. Uh, chocolate milk and ice cream are for children. Tell your husband that Dr. Barry said to grow up. You don't need chocolate milk as a, as a grown man, Okay. I love you, but you don't. Stop it. Ice cream, really? You got to have your ice cream? Come on, okay? His HDL is very low, so this tells me he needs to do two things. He needs to increase the amount of fatty red meat he's eating in his diet, and he needs to start lifting heavy things, okay? He, yeah, the chocolate milk and the ice cream is keeping his triglycerides high. I would love to know what his A1C is because they're also keeping that high as well. They're keeping him a type two diabetic and also contributing to his high blood pressure. I've got videos about high blood pressure on this channel that will help him. Lots of videos about type two diabetes that will help him. Also videos about triglycerides and HDL that will help your husband. But the main thing your husband needs to do is eat like a grown up human male and stop the chocolate milk and ice cream. Give him a kiss for me. Don't, don't let him be mad, but the truth is what it is, right? All right. Good question. Thank you for that. Raina, thanks for all you do for so many people. I've been ketovore for one year, lost 46 pounds, reverse type 2 diabetes. Scale won't budge for over two months now. Any tips? So I've got a video on my YouTube channel called The 13 Reasons Why Your Weight Loss Might Stall. And I go through basically every reason I can think of, both medical reasons, nutrition reasons. So watch that video and investigate each one of those tips thoroughly. Uh, and some of them will involve a trip to your doctor to get some labs checked because very often people have an undiagnosed thyroid condition, adrenal condition, other condition that keeps them from losing the amount of weight they would like to lose. You've only been stalled for two months, which I don't really, I don't count that as an official stall. Okay. You need to be stalled for three solid months. Also, I want you to get a Taylor's tape and take your measurements, all your measurements, just like you were getting measured for a suit of clothes. And do that once a month, because very often, especially women, the scale is not really moving much, but you're losing many inches. And the only way to know that and get that positive feedback is if you take your measurements once a month. So everybody get a tailor's tape and do that, please. Good question. Good question. All right, Brent. Colonoscopy showed adenomas and uh, sessile serrated adenomas polyp. Doctor said limit red meat. So your doctor <clears throat> made an uninformed recommendation based on no meaningful research whatsoever. Uh, go back, just call your doctor and, and talk to his office manager and say, hey, I'd love a copy of the research that the doctor based his recommendation on. Could you print that out? I'm, I know you're busy. I'll wait. You can just email it to me. I want to see the, the study that proves that Eating red meat will make my adenoma turn into colon cancer. Could you could you email that to me, please? And then don't hold your breath waiting for that because you'll never get that because it doesn't exist. This is a very common myth that many healthcare providers believe. They believe in their heart of hearts. Honestly, they believe it that red meat causes colon cancer. I've got a video on this channel that completely shows you the research behind that, which turns out to be a bunch of observational research, which doesn't prove anything. It shows a very weak possible association. 
So uh, your husband can eat all the fatty red meat he wants. Definitely follow up and get repeat colonoscopies to make sure these things are going in the right direction. But if he adopts a carnivore diet, I suspect that when he gets his repeat colonoscopy in three months, six months, 12 months, whatever the doctor decides, uh, these lesions are going to be less severe. And when the doctor says, well, I can see you're eating that plant-based diet because these are the, the adenoma is so much better, your husband can say, well, actually, doc, and that'll be a fun conversation. I hope you share that with all of us. So many doctors mean mean well. They 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 want to give you good advice, <clears throat> but they don't know how wrong they are. <clears throat> One of the ways that doctors get it so wrong is they'll just check a fasting blood sugar, and they won't check any other labs with regards to your metabolic health. And so you've been fasting all night, so you've got a normal blood sugar. What they don't know because they didn't check all the labs is that you're pre-diabetic or type 2 diabetic, but they have no idea because they didn't check all the labs. And that's why Kim Howerton and I wrote this book called Common Sense Labs that tells you all the labs to ask your doctor to order. It tells why you want those. So when your doctor says something stupid like, well, I don't even know what that is, you can be like, Here's what it is right here, doc. Also, not only do we tell you the normal ranges for these tests, we tell you what the optimal range is. Because in many cases, the normal range is too broad and doesn't give you good information. So another good Christmas present, maybe. Uh, maybe even a Christmas present for your doctor or your healthcare provider. There's a link in the show notes, Common Sense Labs book. PCT2R, protein total is 8.1 after doing keto, a little bit higher than in normal range. What this means, do I have to worry? No. So the vast majority of lab tests, the way they figure out what the normal range is, is they'll take 100 random people off the street. They'll check that blood work level. And then they'll go two standard deviations from whatever the mean is. And that's, that's how they set the normal range. I'm not kidding. You would think they test tens of thousands of people and do all kinds of research. No, literally, it's it's usually 100, 200 people. And so if they happen to get 100 people who are plant-based eaters, which the majority of Americans are eating a plant-based diet right now, then they're not going to be getting enough high-quality protein and actually absorbing that protein. So their protein level is going to be falsely high. So I predict, and you guys can hold my feet to the fire over this, over the next three to 10 years, we're going to find that many of our lab ranges, the normal range, is false. It was based on a sick population and doesn't represent optimal health. It just tells you what's basically two standard deviations from the mean. So basically, what's the average guy on the street? What's his total protein? This. Well, I don't want to be the average guy on the street. I want to have the best damn protein I can have. And I think protein, total protein, serum protein is one of the many lab tests that is falsely low because they it was all checked in plant-based diet eaters. Good question. You guys are on it tonight. Thank you so much, Sandy. Carnivorous Me. Hey, I love this Carnivorous Me's YouTube channel. If any of you guys are on a weight, weight loss journey. Like, I mean, you got weight to lose. You need to follow this chick right here. Carnivorous me. Dr. Barry, down 85 pounds now in six and a quarter months. And average glucose levels are 73. I'm no longer a type 2 diabetic. When are you going to let me interview you? No, there you go. That's how you do it right there. First of all, you fix your own shit. And then you start teaching the world how to do it. I love Carnivorous Me. It'd be an honor to come on your channel. I will, uh, I'll reach out to you and we'll, we'll set something up 100%. You guys all subscribe to Carnivorous Me's YouTube channel. She's a pretty cool cat. Chris, when I add extra fats on eggs or meat, even the liquid dripping off the meat, I get all red and flushed. Any idea why? Will PhD help with Chronic candida. Oh, yeah. So candida is a fungus. And uh, many, hundreds, if not thousands of people have, have given us feedback and said, you know, my chronic vaginitis, my chronic athlete's foot, my chronic toenail fungus, my chronic jock itch, other chronic funguses just went away when I adopted either a fatty red meat heavy keto or a ketovore or a carnivore diet. Uh, because candida, a fungus, like all fungus, loves sugar. And when you cut out the sugar and, and, and cut out all the grains, like wheat, rice, oats, and corn, which are full of starch, which turns into sugar, 
your blood sugar comes back down to low normal. And also your insulin, which can be a false growth hormone uh, stimulator or messenger, comes back down to normal as well. And things like chronic candida just go away. Okay, now, uh, many people, when they stop eating a plant-based diet and start eating a diet full of ancestrally appropriate fatty red meat, they'll get like a hot flash after they eat. And that's, uh, in the old days, they call this the meat sweats. Basically, when you eat that degree of nutrient density, your body will rev up your metabolic rate, so to speak. And this is one of the many reasons why eating fatty red meat helps you burn unnecessary fat off your body is because you rev up your metabolic rate. But a lot of people, if you're not used to this, you're like, what the hell? I, I just ate a fatty meat cooked in butter and I got a hot flash. What the heck? It's yeah, it's fine. It's normal. That's the way that's that's your normal body temperature uh, from from now on into the future. If you continue to eat a, a normal, proper human diet. B and B logging. Any truth to red meat being bad for di for diverticulitis? Everything I've seen on it says to limit red meat. Yeah. So most of the mainstream medical authorities will say things like this. Again, the research supporting this is non-existent. I've got a video on this YouTube channel about diverticulitis and what actually causes it. It's not nuts. It's not seeds. It's not red meat. It's none of those things, okay? So check that video out after this live, and then you too will be educated. Are you guys planning to cook something tasty and keto for the holidays? Well, Nisha and Kim Howardson wrote this holiday cookbook. I think it has about 50 keto-friendly recipes. Many of the recipes are either ketovore, or you can make them ketovore with a little, little tweak. Uh, but there is an electronic edition available, but also this paperback. There's a link down in the show notes, holiday cookbook. And so if you need that, need it right now, you can actually download it immediately to your Kindle or whatever electronic reading device you use so that you've got those recipes tomorrow so you can start cooking for the holidays. And, and when you take the recipe from this, please make Nisha's cornbread holy nutcracker. It's the best cornbread I've ever had in my life. And I'm a country boy. So if I say this is the best cornbread I've ever had, that's saying something. And I know that Granny Berry is watching this and I love you, Granny, but this cornbread is better than your cornbread. I'm sorry. It's also keto. Okay. So get this cookbook. There's an e version available so you can download it immediately and start planning your holiday menu. Do you guys like all these Christmas ideas I'm getting here or, or Am I being too salesy and getting on your nerves? Thanks a lot, Tom, for the super chat. Raz G. Hey, Dr. Barry, I'd like to know the recovery case that impressed you the most uh, by someone who changed to a keto diet. <clears throat> so probably the very first patient I had uh, was he weighed about 550 pounds. He had severe bone on bone knee arthritis. He walked with two canes. He uh, just could barely get out. And he was a professional guy. He had a full-time job, and he also had a part-time job uh, as a minister. And he started the keto diet. And when he, he was on the schedule to have knee replacement surgery. And when he came back the next month or three months later, he was not walking with his canes. And this was a long time ago. This is way before I knew the full physiology, a.k.a. the magic of a ketogenic diet. And I and I, I I recognized him, and but he had probably lost I don't know sixty pounds, and he didn't have his canes with him. And I'm like, dude, he's like, Doctor Barry, I feel so much better. My knees, I mean, we had X-rays, we knew they were bone on bone, but they were the pain was ninety percent less in his knees, and that's when I really put my thinking cap on him. Like he hasn't lost enough weight. For his knees not to be hurting. This is the something, something's going on here I don't understand yet. And that's what sent me back to the drawing board or down this rabbit hole that you see here, trying to figure out what the hell this guy had done by eating lots of fatty red meat, uh, eggs with the yolk, a little bit of veg, a few nuts and a few berries, which is what a ketogenic diet is. And in the process of him sending me down that rabbit hole to try to explain, and I knew this guy, honest as the day is long, he was not going to make something up and tell me. And he came back in three months, lost 40 more pounds. I mean, he was just, a, and so when I first met him, he had to actually go to the local co-op and weigh because there was no medical scale in town that was big enough to weigh him. 
And so after I think three months on keto, we could weigh him on our office scales. And so that, that but the, the knee pain going away and other things like that, like how does that make any sense? He's bone on bone. How, how, is, how are his knees not hurting? That's what really sent me down the rabbit hole, Raz G. Thanks for that question. Coffee mocked spas. Feliz Navidad y prospero. Año nuevo. Gracias, Doc. Was that close? Was that terrible? I really tried, but I'm just a, I'm, I'm a gringo mucho. I can't, I, I just, I tried. Buck, do you still recommend the gallery test uh, after the Dr. Fung interview? So especially for people with a very strong family history of cancer, <clears throat> who is very worried, like literally can't sleep at night, like shit, I know I got cancer. I'm going to die. That's, that's it. I'm done. I think the gallery test, which checks for many different kinds of cancer, and it doesn't just look for vague markers. It actually looks for the cancer in your blood. Uh, I think it's an excellent test to, to try to catch cancer early. Um, now, some people should avoid it because some people, then they'll start worrying about what the test results. Oh, my God. So if you're that person, just don't do it. But if you're somebody who has a very strong family history, you've smoked all your life, drink, smoke crack, eat shit all your life, you might want to get that test so you can catch the cancer early if you do have it. Uh, but I don't think everybody needs it. Good question. Good question. Thank you, in Elizabeth. Sandy, suggestions for cough with green phlegm, sore throat, laryngitis, uh, besides an antibiotic, working hard on not taking them ever since being carnivore. So Sandy, this is a general, good general rule. I actually have a, a chapter in my book, Lies My Doctor Told Me. This might make a good Christmas gift. There's a link down there. But I have a whole chapter about the proper use of antibiotics. And for somebody who, ha who has a cough and has a sore throat and has a laryngitis where you've lost your voice, even if you have green phlegm, this is viral. 99.9% .9 of the time, this is viral. An antibiotic is not going to help you at all, Sandy. I would recommend that you fast as much as you can. If you can do a 24, 48-hour fast, sip on some bone broth, sip on some salty water, and just let your body rev up into 100% healing mode and fight off that virus, I think you'll get quicker. The antibiotics are not going to treat this virus whatsoever. And they're going to also increase your risk of a whole host of unwanted complications and side effects. And so, yeah, you definitely don't need an antibiotic for this based on what you've told me. Obviously, consult your doctor. Don Miller, happy holidays to the berries. Thanks for all you do to help others. Thank you so much, Don, for the super chat. It's what I'm called to do, and I won't ever stop doing it. And I really appreciate it when you guys appreciate what I do. Got a new uh, channel member, Angie M. Welcome, Angie. Good to have you, Ron Melrose. Thank you, Ron, for the super chat. Rob says, how important are organ meats on the carnivore diet? Do you think it's sustainable long-term without them? Good question. I'm liable to get Nisha in here on this because she and I disagree on this. I think from my research out of an abundance of caution, all of us should include at least some kind of liver in our diet once or twice a week even if it's just two ounces of chicken liver, cod liver, beef liver, pork, duck, goose, sheep, goat, I don't care. Some kind of liver once or twice a week. I think uh, liver is such a multivitamin, such a superfood that it's silly not to include it. I do not think you're going to develop vitamin A toxicity or any other vitamin, vitamin or mineral toxicity, including copper, by eating liver once or twice a week. Now, if you're eating an entire uh, beef liver raw every day, you might develop copper or vitamin A toxicity. But if you're having a couple of ounces once or twice a week, you're going to get all that priceless nutrition and none of the none of the risks. OK, liver is not a filter. It does not filter and trap toxins. That's not how it works. I've got a video on this YouTube channel to explain that. A lot of people will say, oh, liver is full of toxins. No, it's not. It's not at all. That's not how the human liver works. Now, with all that being said, Nisha, who's a ketovore, she's probably 95% carnivore. <clears throat> she never eats liver, ever. And my good friend, Dr. Sean Baker, an orthopedic surgeon, who has been eating a carnivore diet for five or six years now, 
never eats liver. And he does great. He's breaking world records for his age in certain sports. I mean, he's not as pretty as me. I think that's probably probably due to the liver that I eat. But uh, he's he's in excellent health. He feels like a million bucks. So is it necessary, mandatory? Perhaps not. But I would recommend liver once or twice a week out of an abundance of caution. Good question. Thank you for that. Mike, any current, uh, oh, any comment on folate on carnivore, particularly those who are pregnant? Yeah, carnivore uh, eggs and, and, and other carnivore yummies are full of folate. I don't know why people think carnivore is a low folate diet. It's definitely not. Uh, Nisha ate lots of egg yolks, which are a great source of folate. I actually have a video on this channel about excellent sources of folate. So it could be, Mike, that you were miscalculating. Uh, cr a chronometer is pretty darn good at calculating carbs, but some of the vitamins and minerals, they don't get right. Um, potassium is another one that I think we're going to find it as years go by. And if you're eating a high-carb plant-based diet, you need to get lots of potassium in your diet. But if you're eating a very, very low-carbohydrate, nutrient-dense diet, you're going to get all the potassium you need, even if it doesn't meet the RDI. And we're seeing that more and more in carnivores who don't use any electrolyte supplements. Uh, they barely even salt their food. They just eat fatty red meat. And they're doing amazing. And they've been doing this for decades. So, uh, yeah, there's plenty of folate on a, a keto, ketovore, or a carnivore diet. Good question. Cecil, can you give me the info of Xarelto 20 milligrams instead of low dose aspirin. So the decision between these two is going to be something that you and your doctor make together. Uh, hopefully your doctor informs you thoroughly. Xarelto do, does have some possible side effects and complications, but so does aspirin. So depending on your medical condition and what medical problems you've had, you may need Xarelto 20 milligrams. Okay. But it, now, now this goes for everybody, all 2,700 of you guys, if your doctor says, hey, I, want, I think you need to start taking this, it is not a, a sin. It is not a foul. If you say, OK, doc, and you go get a second opinion from a, a, a lateral second opinion. So if the cardiologist told you to take Xarelto 20 milligrams, go to another cardiologist in another city and say, hey, I just want to make sure this makes sense to you. Look over my records. Uh, I don't I don't. I don't dislike this cardiologist. I don't mistrust him. I just want to make sure before I start taking any prescription medicine that I really need it. Could you look over my record and make sure you agree that I need Xarelto 20 milligrams? And I think all you guys can do that with any medication that you're leery. If your spider sense is tingling, you're like, I don't know. Get a second opinion. Any doctor who's offended by that is not much of a doctor. Uh, I've, I had patients many times go get a second opinion and they've come back and they would tell me, I, I went and uh, you told me this about my gut and I went and saw a gastroenterologist and he told me the same thing. So I'm going to do it. And I, I'm not offended by that. This is your one life, Cecil. This is your one chance to have a healthy, happy life. I'm not going to get upset if you verify what I said as a doctor with another doctor. That's your right. So please, a new member, Pat Johnson. Welcome, Pat. James Wall. Hey, Doc. Loving proper human diets. Lost 70 pounds. Seven zero pounds. Feeling great. My triglycerides are down from the 160s to 49. Remember earlier, our friend who was drinking the chocolate milk and eating the ice cream? This is what happens when you're eating super low carb. Last blood work, my LDL went from 110 the 115 was told by a nurse practitioner to lower <laughs> animal protein and red meat portions. Should I find a new doc? It depends, James. So there's two strategies here. You could just find a new doc, okay? Especially if you don't really like this healthcare provider, if y'all are not really jiving, just find somebody else. That's your right, okay? You're a grown-ass human. You can do that. Or if you really like this doc and you've got a bond, you're like, I hate to, I hate to lose him or her then why not try to educate them? And, and a lot of you guys, when I say that, you're like, I'm a truck driver. I, I, I'm a waitress. How am I going to educate my doctor? That don't even make no sense. Yeah, it does. <clears throat> because when they see the tremendous improvement in your health, they're going to pay attention to that. Especially if you respectfully say, look, doc, I've lost 70 pounds and I actually did it by eating lots of animal 
protein and animal fat. So I want to keep you. I like you. But you got to stop saying dumb stuff to me like cut back on animal protein and animal fat because that's literally how I'm getting healthier. And so a good thing you could do is get that doctor a copy of Lies My Doctor Told Me and say, I want to keep you and I want to work with you, but I need you to do some reading because the the, the nutrition and medical times, they are a changing. And I need you to stay up current with the times. Come here, Becky. Let me let me show everybody. Come here, come here. You guys are gonna love this. Yes, please. Yes, yes, yes. Come see me. I wanna, I wanna hold you. Mom got a new thing, a new blanket. Oh, yes, we got a new blanket. Please sit, sit in my lap. Please just go say hi to everybody. Okay. Becky doesn't want to show you his hair. You want to show him? Yeah, come here. So, Nisha trimmed Lily, our standard poodle's hair. And Beckett watched this and with a, and he's very, he, he's very smart. And so as soon as she laid down the clippers and was cleaning up and everything, he proceeds to go and get the dog clippers and go just like that, all just this short. And so he came to his mommy and she, he was talking to her and I heard her say, oh, my God, and hugged him. And I was like, oh, he's done something really bad. I don't know what. <laughs> <laughs> and he had buzzed. I mean, I couldn't make a mohawk. I couldn't do anything the way he'd done it. Yeah. And so I just we shaved his head, and now he looks like a, a new prisoner that we've we've treated for lice. Who do you look like? Who, who, oh, he also looks like Poppy, his grandfather, because Poppy's got no hair. So he said, "I look just like Poppy now." <laughs> you silly, you silly boy, get out of here! Go do something. That was yesterday. Was a fun day at our house. Yes, it was. Yes, it was. Because that was not the only thing that happened. <clears throat> uh, James was told LDL cholesterol is more important to control than triglycerides. Is this correct? Thank you. No, James, it's not correct. Uh, I actually have a video about how not to have a heart attack. And in that video, I show a pie chart of everything that has the highest risk of giving you a heart attack or a stroke. And LDL cholesterol doesn't even make the top 10. Number one, by far, our biggest and, and, and most dangerous risk factors, type 2 diabetes. High blood pressure is way up there on the list. High triglycerides way up there on the list. Uh, LDL cholesterol is number 13 or number 14. So it is a tiny risk, perhaps, but it's not. A, it doesn't even make the top 10. So if your doctor didn't mention the other top 10 things that I talk about in that video, James, that would be a great learning opportunity for your doctor. You might even just print out the, the screenshot of that and say, look, doc, these are the top 10 things, according to the research study that I printed out, because Dr. Barry put it in the show notes. They say these are the top most dangerous things that could give me a heart attack. And LDL cholesterol is not even in the top 10. But you didn't mention these other things. Why would you ignore the top 10 things and talk about number 14 on the list, doc? I'm just a simple man, but that don't make no sense, right? And I think if you approach your doc like that respectfully and say, why are you talking about risk number 13 or 14 and you didn't even talk about the top 10 risks for a heart attack? I don't understand. I'm confused. Could you explain that to me? I think those kind of questions that you guys put to your doctors, that's going to change the way they practice medicine for the rest of their career. And that's a very powerful thing that you can do to make the world a better place. Good question. Jim, what are your thoughts on a salad once a week that consists of tomatoes, cucumbers, and green peppers? The rest of the week is meat and eggs. So, Jim, if you want to cheat on carnivore once a week with a salad, I mean, you could do way worse, right? I'd much rather you cheat with a salad than with a hot fudge cake or a box of donuts, or a family-sized bag of Doritos. But there's no nutrition in the tomatoes, cucumbers, green peppers that you cannot get from the meat and eggs. But if you just want to cheat on uh, carnivore with keto once a week, and this goes for all you guys, if you want to have a salad once a week, or you want to have something that's still low carb and, and still natural and grew in the dirt, I think that's probably fine. Yeah, but you're not getting any nutrition from that, that you can't get from meat and eggs. Scat Piper. That's a good handle. Thank you, Scat Piper. 
Skit Piper. I feel like it's all in how you say it, don't you think? Cindy, I thanked our new PCP in Kentucky for not giving us crap about being keto. He replied, he too has had success with keto also. And this is what a lot of you guys don't realize. More and more doctors and dietitians and nutritionists and pharmacists and physical therapists are, are using keto to fix their own obesity problem or their own type 2 diabetes. And but they're still a little bit skittish about recommending it to patients because they don't want to get in trouble because it's not technically standard of care yet. Yet. But when somebody like Cindy goes to a, a doc, primary care doc says, well, I'm eating keto and, and then tells them I've got had all these benefits from eating keto. If that doctor's already been using keto to lose weight or lower their A1C or lower their blood pressure or get rid of fatty liver or all the other things that a proper hemodial will do for you, that doctor is going to be much more likely to say, well, I do keto too. I think it's fine. So well done, Cindy, for being brave and telling your doctor the truth. Want a duck fin? I'm healthy, 72-year-old female. My bad cholesterol is 136. All other tests are very good. Doc recommends small dose statin. I said no. What do you think? The fact that you're a 72-year-old female makes up my mind completely because the research on all-cause mortality is very, very clear for older women, women over the age really of 60. You absolutely will not benefit from lowering your total cholesterol or your LDL cholesterol. Women, uh, especially over the age of 60, live longer. They have cancer less if they have a high total total cholesterol. So I'm glad that your cholesterol is a little bit high. It's not bad high, but a little bit because that actually is very protective against dying prematurely and against cancer and other causes of death. Good question. And Elizabeth just became a member. Welcome. 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 Cody Mills, what causes pregnancy dizziness? So when you get pregnant, Lots of fluid shifts are happening in the body. Lots of electrolyte shifts. Uh, your blood volume is increasing. Your respiratory output is changing. Lots of things are changing. And very often, the very first symptom that a woman has that she's pregnant is she either gets lightheaded and dizzy or she just passes clean out. And, and in the workup for why this woman is dizzy or uh, passed out, we check a pregnancy test and lo and behold, there you go. But there's several physiological mechanisms that can make a woman dizzy, lightheaded, or even pass out when she's uh, first pregnant. It's a good question. In a minute, I'm going to tell you guys a Christmas gift you can get for yourself, but not yet. Hang on. Teefs, Dr. Barry, how are you doing? Did you eat dairy before the live? Um, I had a little bit of heavy cream in my coffee this morning. Uh, but, and so what uh, Tefs is alluding to is I used to have a huge phlegm problem. If you go back and watch my videos from four years ago, five years ago, when I was keto, I would, I would put a little coffee in my heavy cream, eating a ton of cheese, and I was <clears throat> constantly clearing my throat. I was making too much phlegm because I was eating too much dairy, drinking too much dairy. And now I, I probably consume 95% less dairy than I did four years ago. And I don't have nearly uh, the problem with phlegm production as I did back then. But I did cough earlier, so uh, you're on your toes. You caught that. Eric, the pilot. I've been doing the carnivore diet for two months, but I notice when I go to sleep, my heart is pounding hard. Seems to go away when I have carbs. Uh, I've been taking element minerals and the drops you recommend. What do you recommend? So, Eric, if this is worrying you, I recommend you go see your doctor and get, get some heart tests done just to make sure there's nothing wrong. I don't think there is anything wrong. When you're keto adapted and your heart muscle is burning ketones instead of glucose, your cardiac output and your stroke volume are actually increase. Your heart is, beats more efficiently and beats more powerfully when it's burning ketones like beta hydroxybutyrate. And I think this is what you're detecting. Not everybody can detect this. Some people can't feel their heartbeat, but some people can. And when I'm deep in ketosis, I can, I can I'm like you, I can feel my heart going at it. Uh, but I don't think that's a sign of pathology. I don't think that's a sign of disease. I think that's just a heart that's being fueled properly. That's how a human heart should be. Good question. 
Dewan, hey doc, thoughts on a few drops of apple cider vinegar and water to add electrolytes to the to the body. So uh, it's a good question, D1. There's not enough electrolytes in apple cider vinegar to affect your electrolyte levels in any way. A lot of people, and you may have seen some YouTube videos that uh, that intimated that apple cider vinegar is somehow magical. It's not. Okay, it's just it's just apple vinegar. It's it's what it is. It's vinegar that was made out of apples. Uh, there's no magic anything in it. It does have a few a very small amount of electrolytes. Uh, if you're a severe type 2 diabetic eating a high carb diet, using apple cider vinegar will lower your blood sugar a few points, but not enough to matter. If you have severe heartburn, apple cider vinegar will help that until you've healed your reflux or heartburn with uh, carnivore or somewhere on the proper human diet spectrum. But there's nothing magic about apple cider vinegar. Raycab one, are there any foods I could add to this diet to get a little variety without changing the good effects? So yeah, if you're, it depends. If you're keto, there are literally thousands of, of foods you can add to your keto diet. As long as you mind your carbs, don't go over your carb count, that's just fine, okay? If you're ketovore, there's, there's at least 500 things you can add. And if you're carnivore, there's 100 different animal-based foods that you can eat on a carnivore diet. Uh, there, it's not limited. It's limited only by your imagination, right, Cap? Good question. Laura, after getting your book, I personally asked for this test. Uh, CK CK Mayo 131, 92% macro tap BB. Can I stay? On? Yeah, I don't know what that test, I don't know what that is. That's not, um, that's not in my, my lab book unless that's a, um, typo. Uh, can I stay on beef, butter, bacon, and eggs with, uh, macro creatinine kinase type two? So this is something you need to talk to your doctor about. I'm not, I'm not really for sure. I understand your question. They're ordering a PET scan next week. Yep. De definitely get the PET scan and follow up with them and do whatever they recommend. But I'm, I'm sorry. I, I don't really understand what you're asking me. Jerry, I've been on carnivore for four months now. My blood sugars are getting higher. Just tested 219, two hours after eating a big old ribeye. I've lost over 30 pounds, 100, 180 pounds down to 148 pounds, and I don't understand. So, Jerry, this is where getting your hemoglobin A1C, your fasting insulin, and your C-peptide check, that's where these come in because they're going to tell you. You may have developed uh, adult onset type 1 diabetes, and that the way you're going to know is to get those three tests checked. And if you, if you want to write those down, just – Replay this video and watch that again. You can write those down. But that's way too high uh, for a blood sugar to be on a carnivore diet. So something's going on. You got to get that checked out. Thank you very much, Jane, for the super sticker. Whoa. Craig, prostate cancer, stage three, beef, butter, bacon, and eggs. I was 160 pounds. I've lost down to 127. Radiation staging tomorrow. I don't want to do this. I feel fantastic. No hormone shots. Sorry to vent. I understand, Craig, but you are where you are in your life stage, right? You've got stage three prostate cancer, which is a solid tumor, which beef, butter, bacon, and eggs is going to keep your blood sugar as low as it can possibly be, which is going to slow down the progression of that cancer, but you've still got to follow up with your oncologist. Okay. More and more oncologists are starting to use keto and some are even starting to use carnivore as an adjunct therapy along with chemo and radiation therapy. This is becoming much more common. At first, oncologists, if you even said the word keto, they would discharge you from their practice. They wouldn't even see you as a doctor. But more and more commonly now, they're saying, no, actually, as the research comes out, I want you to be as keto as you can be because that's going to help my radiation and my chemotherapy. It's going to help your body be more resilient and stand up to the treatment, which is very rough. But also, it's not going to be the keto diet's not going to be feeding the cancer like a high carbohydrate plant based diet would be. So, more and more oncologists are getting on board with this. Ah, PCT2R says, how many eggs do you recommend in a day? Somewhere between two and 20 eggs a day. Basically, eat as many eggs in a day as you want to eat in a day that you find delicious, that you find filling. 
Uh, if you start to develop a, an egg aversion, like, oh, I'm going to puke if I eat another egg, you've probably eaten too many eggs. My good friend, uh, Joseph, on the YouTube channel, What I Learned, it's a great YouTube channel. Go follow What I've Learned. Uh, he's got, I don't know how many hundreds of videos, excellent videos. And he was eating, uh, I think, 120 eggs. In a, in like It's crazy. He ate so many eggs. Nothing bad happened. He didn't die. He actually put on more muscle, and he actually had a lot of positive benefits. And the reason he chose the number of eggs that he chose is because in a, in a vegan movie that was out, a, do, a documentary a few years back, they said for every egg you eat, it's like smoking five cigarettes. And so he ate enough eggs per day, so it was like he was smoking five packs of cigarettes a day, which you would think would kill somebody, right? He actually got healthier, and he put on more muscle mass. His bone density improved, and his all of his me metabolic markers improved. Eating, I forget, 120 eggs a week, some ungodly number. Go check out his video. Watch that. You'll be, you'll be fascinated by that. Matt, hey, Ken, carnivore for over a year, five foot nine, 185 pounds, 13% body fat. That's a very good body fat percentage, Matt. Uh, beef, eggs, and water. I, I carry about 15 pounds of extra water. Any advice on dropping the water? Uh, how do you know you carry 15 pounds of extra water, Matt? If your body fat percentage is, is 13%, I'm assuming you had a, a, a DEXA scan. You may have done the calipers or the, the, the immersion but I suspect you did a DEXA scan, but I doubt seriously at five foot nine and 185, if you're holding 15 pounds of, of unhealthy water. Now we all are holding lots of water. We're 60% water. I'm currently holding over a hundred pounds of water, but that's okay. That's normal. I'm supposed to, I'm supposed to be made predominantly of water, right? So don't worry about that. I don't, I don't think you're holding that much water. Definitely not that much unhealthy water. Uh, Pixie Doodle. Chicken is rarely spoken of except for eggs. What's the reason behind that in fast food and our fast food chains like Kentucky Fried Chicken suitable for PhD? So the reason that carnivores don't talk about chicken as much as we do beef and sheep and goat is because beef, sheep, and goat are ruminant animals. They have a multi-chamber stomach and they use lots of bacteria to break down what they eat and turn it into very, very healthy, proper human diet food. Chickens are monogastric. So are pigs. Uh, so are most, uh, all poultry. So are humans. And so they are not able to break down and to, to process and to get rid of toxins like ruminant animals do. Chicken is typically a little bit higher in omega-6 to omega-3 ratio than beef. That's another problem some people have with it. Uh, now, the fast food change like Kentucky Fried Chicken. So full disclosure, I freaking love Kentucky Fried Chicken. What, do, do you like uh, original recipe or extra crispy better? Or is there, is there a third choice now? And I haven't eaten KFC in eight years, nine years. But I was an extra crispy guy. Freaking loved it. Still do love it. But they fry their, their chicken under pressure in, I forget, either soybean or canola, corn, cottonseed. It's a terrible, terrible oil. And the, they pressurize the cooker. And I used to help my dad work on these cookers. So I'm, I'm very, very familiar with how they do this. It's a lot of pounds of pressure. And so it forces that oil into the breading and into the chicken itself. And so when you're eating uh, pressure cooked chicken like at KFC or Popeye's or any of the other fast food chicken joints, you're, you might as well just drink out of the canola bottle. Drink out of the soybean oil. It, it's terrible. Terrible, terrible. Don't, don't eat their chicken. It's not PhD appropriate because of all the vegetable seed oils and the other junk. New member, Mechanoid. Welcome. Linda. Glucose tanks two to three hours after meals down to the 80. So, Linda, a, a blood glucose of 80 is normal. That's a very good blood sugar. Now, if you currently had a very, if you previously had a very high A1C and you were very diabetic, you can have low blood sugar symptoms for a while as you get back to normal, even with the blood sugar in the 80s. If you're not, if you're used to running 260, then you're going to feel like a hypo with an 80, but 80 is normal. But I understand you're getting symptomatic. I'm, uh, 
Omnicarnivore, A1C is 5.1. That's excellent. Trigs are 78, beautiful, but high calcium, high bilirubin, high albumin, have uh, CGM to track glucose until next appointment. Good. Now, if you have high calcium, you've got to ask your doctor for an intact PTH and an ionized calcium level. Uh, the most common cause for a woman to have high calcium is hyperparathyroidism, which is very commonly missed by primary care doctors. Uh, some women are, it's missed for years. And so the high bilirubin may or may not be a big issue, may or may not be a problem. The high bilirubin, same, same regard, may or may not be anything to worry about. But the high calcium has got to be thoroughly investigated. Okay, and if your doctor doesn't want to check those tests, find a doctor who will because you do not want to be walking around with undiagnosed hyper parathyroidism because it can it can make your life miserable wear your cgm follow up at the next appointment and ask for those two tests that i just told you about somebody said do you recommend drinking ketones uh no you, i recommend that you make your own ketones by eating a very very low carbohydrate diet your body will make ketones for you you don't have to buy them in a bottle or in a powder form no insanity, 61-year-old total cholesterol 120, triglyceride 77, LDL 54, that's a little on the low side, HDL 51, ketone is 3.2 and mostly carnivore, OMAD only losing a half pound to one pound a month since I started one year ago. So uh, no insanity, I recommend you watch my video called the 13 reasons why your weight loss might stall. Uh, and, and investigate all those. Because although you're not stalled, you're still losing a pound a month, uh, congratulations on losing a pound a month, by the way. Some women can't do that. But I, I agree, you should probably be losing a little faster than that. So you may have an undiagnosed thyroid, adrenal, or other issue that could be slowing down your weight loss. Also, you guys all keep in mind, there's a long list of medications that your doctor can prescribe, which will effectively turn off your ability to lose weight. And many doctors don't warn you about this. There is a long list of medications that will make you gain weight. And many doctors don't warn you about this either. And so if you're taking any medications, no insanity, go back and look at them, look up the package insert, do an internet search and see if, if it's known to gain, make you gain weight or slow down weight loss. New member, Marsha, welcome. Damien, I think Nisha's just set off the buzzer telling me to get off here. I'm going to get Damien's though. And then I got to tell you guys what Christmas present to get yourself. Damien says been carnivore for two months. Generally low ketones. My ketones are around 0.2. What is powering my brain? Ketones. So the ketones that you're measuring are not the ketones you're using. So once you're keto adapted, some people call this fat adapted, but I like the term keto adapted because it makes it, you understand what I'm talking about better, I think. You're burning the ketones as you make them. You're not just building up a big surplus in your bloodstream. And so that's what's happening. You're making them and then using them immediately to power your brain, your heart muscle, and all the other parts of your body. So congratulations. You're doing this exactly right, Damien. Well done. Huzzah. Now, let me tell you guys what you can do for a Christmas present for yourself. There is no wealth without good health. And so I would say, why don't you become a member of our private support community? There's a link right down in the show notes. And over the course, starting, we can start January 1 if you want to, but I'd like to start a little sooner, maybe the day after Christmas or maybe even the day before Christmas on you reclaiming the best health that's possible for you. And we've got over 1,800 people in this private protected community. We never sell your information. There is no advertising in there. It's just a whole bunch of people who are focused on using a proper human diet to reap the benefits of having the best health they can possibly have, a level of health that many of them never dreamed they'd have again. So consider for yourself becoming a member of our community, five bucks a month, 12 bucks a month, 20 bucks a month, you pick and you get the benefits commensurate with that. Become a member and I promise you, it'll be better than any copay you've ever spent at the doctor's office. I got to get out of here. Nisha's giving me the stink eye. Thank you so much for hanging out with me. Thanks for sharing this video if you think it'll help friends and family members. This is Dr. Barry. Have a very Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays, and I'll see you next time.